life now. Okay. So did you give me a, an introduction? Okay, well, I'll just, I'll say a spontaneous introduction. School of Bhakti, okay, that's what that is, okay. School of Bhakti, okay. Let's go. Okay, we live, Raghunath? Yes. Okay, so I would just like to thank everybody for tuning in tonight. We have Martin Horsner, also known as Mahatma Prabhu, and uh, he's been teaching uh, for 50 years now uh, positive uh, mindsets and techniques for meditation. I've just got his recent book, Japa Affirmations on Amazon, amazing. Anybody that wants to get deep into meditation should check out that book. So. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about um, uh, again how to be positive in uh, what is a difficult time for us right now during this coronavirus lockdown. So I'll hand you over now to Martin Horsner. Thank you. Nice to see you all again. We have a chair next to me. My wife was supposed to be sitting in it, but I just looked up at the house and there's a car there and I have this strange feeling She's talking to somebody, something happened, but she may come, she may not come, but uh, if not this time, she'll come another time. So the topic is, uh, the topic I was given is relationships during lockdown. So I was thinking, well, what about relationships after lockdown? Uh, is there a difference? And I think specifically at Hooks, is you referring to the fact that um, during lockdown, we're much closer to our family or the people we're living with and maybe relationships are more strained because of that. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe we're, we're driving someone crazy or someone is driving us crazy, like something like that. That's, yeah. Well, what, one of the interesting, one of the most interesting things that are funny things I ever heard about relationship, relationships, maybe you've heard this before. There's a saying, in every bad relationship you ever had, you were there. Huh, really? Yeah, I guess I was, right? Yeah. So what does that mean? Well, it takes two to tango. If you don't know what tango is, it's a dance from South America, something like that, I think. You tango in Scotland or you have your own? Uh, we pogo. Pogo, it takes two to pogo. Yeah, we, we do punk rock, but what well, we used to do it when I was a kid. I mean, <laughs> so, you know, in, in any relationship which is strained or difficult, there's, there's always the tendency to think, well, what, what's the other person contributing to it? Because we always think we're innocent. That's just human nature to think it's someone else's fault. And it may be true to some degree, but usually it's a synthesis, a combination, an alchemy of two people. And, you know, we get along better with some than others. And sometimes we get along really well with our neighbors because we never see them. Oh, I have a great relationship with my neighbors. Yeah, right. You never see them. That's why you have a great relationship. There's a big tall fence between you. That's why you have a good relationship. But, but if you live with your neighbors in the same house, I don't know if you'd have a good relationship. That's another thing. So what, what I like to do, what I would suggest doing first thing is where there's a strained relationship, it's always good to ask myself, what am I contributing to the strained relationship? How, and you might say, I'm not contributing, it's only the other person's fault. Okay, then even if that were true, then I have to ask myself, how can I neutralize the strain, the, the dysfunction or whatever the problem is? How, how can I neutralize it? What can I do at least not to make it worse? And that's, so that's, that's one meditation. And, and you know, we, we could go for 10 days just, just meditating on what we contribute to bad relationships and then connecting that to triggers in ourself and why we're triggered and where did they come from and you know you could go down this dark hole for a long time 
And I'll let you do that on your own. Or you can think about it now and you have some questions about it. But, but the question I would ask myself is, okay, you know, this is difficult. So what's being triggered in me? What are they triggering in me that I'm acting this way? We could say, well, they're very selfish or they're very, they're trying to control me or they're de demanding of me things that uh, they shouldn't be demanding or whatever. But what is that triggering in you? Like, why is it bothering you? And then meditate on that. Like, why does that exist? What's, what's going on? And can I deal with it in a better way? Can I improve it? Heal it. Um, so self-reflection is really good. Because when you start looking at yourself and what you're contributing to a situation, even the other person's at fault, you can do so much to improve yourself and you can do so much to learn about it. To learn about yourself. So there's a, it's kind of a funny saying. When you squeeze an orange, what comes out of the orange is what's inside the orange. So when you squeeze an orange, you get orange juice. Why? Because, well, that's an orange. You're not going to get strawberry juice because that's what's inside the orange. Okay, that's, that's simple. You have the word da in Scotland. You say da if something's yeah. obvious. You say, yeah. how do you say it? We say in America, duh. You say it like that or you have another way? Um, we say ye. Ye means duh? Yeah. Okay. Ye, ye. That's it. Okay. So when you squeeze an orange, orange juice comes out because that's what's inside. And when we're squeezed, then what comes out of us is what's inside of us. Now, the interesting thing is when we're squeezed, what's coming out of us we think is actually put in by the other person. It's not actually coming out of us. <laughs> it's not true. We're like, we're so, we're, we're human beings. We're so interesting. You know, like sometimes we're walking around going, hey, there's so many problems in the world and the planet's being messed up and there's so much war and violence, you know. And we don't realize that we are in some way contributing to messing up the planet even we don't think we do or, real, or we don't realize it or we're in some way contributing to violence in our words. Sometimes we get angry or we don't speak nicely. So we're so interesting that sometimes we can't even see what we're doing. So when something comes out of us, it is actually in there. It's nobody put it in there. I have a funny experience. It's like as Hoxha was saying, I teach meditation. So we do these retreats and we, we chant, we chant the Hare Krishna mantra. Like sometimes we chant in these retreats the whole day. This mantra, most, many of you know the mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. So we chant this mantra. Normally in my life, I chant two hours a day. I took a vow to do that. But at the retreats, some days we chant eight, nine, 10 hours. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, the whole world is just turned off completely. But what, what happens is in, very, very interesting because chanting is cleaning your heart. And you know what happens when you clean, like uh, you lift the carpet up, what happens? Ooh, there's dirt under the carpet. How did that get there, right? You, you want to see some good dirt, pull out your refrigerator and pull out your stove. You find some good dirt there, right? So, but before you pull it out and start cleaning, you don't see any dirt. It seems like everything's fine. And then you pull it out and you look at it and you go, oh my God, there's so much dirt here. And it's like a shock. Have you ever done that? Like pulled out your stove or refrigerator? There's so much dirt that gathers behind it. And, and it's kind of shocking to see all the dirt. And it was kind of nicer before you pulled, pulled out the stove or refrigerator because you couldn't see the dirt. So chanting is, it's purifying us. And in that purification, it's like moving the stove and refrigerator and, and we look behind it and go, oh my God, I didn't know there was so much dirt. But that means the chanting's working, it's purifying. And then we see the dirt. And, but when we see the dirt, it's like, hmm, you know. That's not fun. 
But, but the point is, the dirt was there, now we're seeing it. So if somebody does something that upsets us and we lose our patience or tolerance, we become angry or say some nasty things, we, we kind of think, well, that was just the person, you know, they're, they're, they're really to blame. But the fact is, if we don't have that nature, there's nothing they can activate in us, right? Like, like people are only activating what's inside of us. So if I'm becoming upset, you know, with my family or the people I'm living with more than normal because we're all on top of one another, driving one another crazy. Okay, there's some justification, you know. Um, we're all, you know, locked up in a little house or apartment. Yeah, so there is some justification there. But the idea is you want to look and say, okay, you know, I just got squeezed. And so, you know, what is being activated inside of me? Because I'm becoming upset, but it's ultimately not the person that's causing me to be upset. It's that I have that nature inside of me. And that, that can really help us a lot to confront, okay, this person's doing this and that and it, and it upsets me. But the question is, why am I getting upset? Because here's, here's the big takeaway. I think this is the big takeaway for today. So if you weren't paying attention, pay attention now because this will help you. When we see somebody acting in a way that's upsetting, we kind of assume like we're gonna, we have to get upset. Like that, well, he's upsetting, so you get upset. It just makes sense, right? It's logical. Somebody does something upsetting, so you get upset, and that's normal. That's what we do, we get upset. So we think it's normal, but if somebody does something upsetting, being upset is not the only reaction. And by, by, there's so many other reactions you could have. And I, I have a story. I'll tell you my own story. And this is, this is how I learned this. And later I learned more about this from other teachers, but at first I learned it myself. So this person did something that was very upsetting. It was, it was a kind of a betrayal. And then I became really upset with him. And, and then I had no contact with this person after that. I didn't, I didn't want to have contact with them. A person really let me down and said, what kind of friend is this? This kind of, not a friend, but we work together. I mean, you could say friends, but we work together. So he let us down in a huge way, huge, huge, huge let down, huge betrayal. And so I just, I didn't want to think about it. I didn't want to talk to him. I didn't want to see him. I didn't want to deal with him. And later on, Many, 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 many years later, I was reflecting on this. And then I realized that his betrayal was a result of struggles he was going through. And I was very unsympathetic to those struggles. And so I allow myself to be upset with him rather than to be understanding of the struggles and then be empathetic towards those struggles, maybe even compassionate towards those struggles. I feel, feel bad that he went through that. But the whole time I was feeling bad about how he treated me. And so I was blaming him for being upset. And then I realized later on, being upset was not the only way to react. You might say it was a natural way to react, but maybe a natural way from a very low level of consciousness. And so later I was able to react with understanding with some degree of empathy and some degree of compassion. And then I wasn't upset anymore because I understood what he did, he had to do, even though it came out, it came across as a betrayal. This is, it was the best he could do. He couldn't do any better. And I know that he wanted to do better, but he couldn't. And I know that he was suffering. And when I realized all that, my response changed. So we tend to think when we're hurt or when we're treated in a certain way and we react badly, we, we tend to think that's the only way to react. And so, you know, the big takeaway is the way we normally react to a situation is not the only way to react. And you can ask yourself, could I react in a different way? 
Is there a better way to react than the way I'm reacting? So then now we take it up to this like very high spiritual level. And I read this amazing thing today. Just let me see if I can find it. This will like, this will, uh, excuse me. This will, this is, this is, okay. I won't even tell you what it is. I'll just read it. I don't even know how to describe what it is. It's so amazing. Someone sent me a WhatsApp. Yeah, all I have to do, let's go through the last 7,000 WhatsApp messages. No, I'll put in her name. I think it was on WhatsApp. Yeah. No, she must have sent it on Facebook. Yes. Okay, you're in for a treat today. This is amazing. This was found on a piece of paper in a concentration camp in Poland. This is, you know, and this woman was killed, I believe, I believe this woman was killed. This is amazing. And she, she saw 50,000 other women being killed. And this is what she said. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, Lord, remember not only the men and women of goodwill. In other words, She's a, she must be a Christian woman or no, she's a Jew, not Christian, a Jew, she's a Jewish woman. So she must have had a lot of religious faith. And she's saying, don't remember all the, the innocent people who were killed, but also remember those of ill will. In other words, those who killed them and imprisoned them. But do not remember the suffering they have inflicted upon us. Remember the fruits we brought thanks to this suffering. So she's saying, because of this situation, we became very close. These are the fruits of being, this, this is amazing. These are the fruits of being in a concentration camp. Comer, comradership, comrade, excuse me, comradership, loyalty to one another, humility, courage, generosity, the greatness of heart, which has grown out of this. So she's saying, we got to experience this all. It was like an amazing time in that way. We got to experience all, all of this. And when they came to judgment, let all the fruits, let the, when these men come to judgment, let all the fruits that we have borne be their forgiveness. Can you imagine that? Somebody thinking like that? That's like, that's like up there, like the top three people, spiritually elevated people in the universe, isn't it? Or, you know, the top 10. So, this is, this is obviously not the reaction that you and I would have or most people would have. Maybe, maybe we would have, try to have, or maybe, but now that we've read this, maybe uh, we could be better. And, and if you think about, one of the things that I think is such a problem in our society today, the things that bother us are so different and so often just really stupid, isn't it? Like when I was a little boy, my father played golf and he wanted me to play golf with him. And even though I really didn't like it, I would just do it because I just went along with the program, right? But I was young, maybe like 11, 12, 13. I didn't understand much. And we were driving up to the golf course and this one man was getting in the car, throwing his golf clubs in the car, slamming the door and just, ah! really angry and I couldn't understand. And I said, why is he so angry? He just came out of the, off the golf course. The golf courses, you, know, you go there for fun. And you ought to know Scotland is the, the birthplace of golf, right? You, it's all your fault, the Scottish people, that, that all these, no, it's not your fault. It's good, we have green, that's actually good we have green. I'm just joking. It's good we have more green, yeah. You, you're, you're glorious, you made more green in the world. So, I said, why is he so upset? My father said, oh, he had a bad game. And I said, but, you know, it's like it didn't make sense. Why would you get upset about that? There's so many things you could get upset about. Like, you know, why not get upset about that time I was in Los Angeles, it was terrible smog. Why not get upset about smog? We have to do something. There was still segregation. Why not get upset about segregation? You know, 
but we allow ourselves to get upset. You know, oh, I went to the mall to get the latest Nikes and they were sold out. Ah, ah. So this is what we're getting upset about, right? When I was with some woman and she was with her daughter and she was telling her daughter, you know, it was a similar situation. And she was telling her daughter, her daughter was saying, why are they, why are they so upset? And she said, she said, Susan, these are rich people's problems. They get upset because, you know, all the Gucci purses sold out or all the designer, the Nike shoes in my size or so. So, you know, often when, when you think about what you get upset about in relationships, you'll see it's pretty petty, or we could even say, in some cases, stupid. And, and then we see these examples of exalted spiritual persons, like this lady, Jesus Christ, and so forth. They're being killed, and they're thinking about the welfare of the people who are killing them. It's, it's incredible. And, and not to say that we could ever come to that level, but at least it's, it's in front of us. It's an example that we could be better. And it's an example that when we're getting squeezed, we should be aware that what's coming out of us, it's in us. If it's coming out, it, nobody can put it there. It has to be within us. Now, you, I might say, you make me angry. But the actual thing, the reality is, you are a catalyst for my own anger. That's, that's what you make me angry means. You're a catalyst for my anger. And I'm not controlling my anger. And so therefore you become the catalyst. But you don't have to, but I'm letting you, right? Have you ever become envious of someone? Of course, we've all become envious, right? Is it that person's fault that I'm envious of them? You might say, yeah, it's their fault. You know, they have this and I don't have it. And that's not fair. But really, is everyone in the world envious of that person? Of course not. I'm envious of that person. It's about me. It's not about them. They have nothing to do with my envy. They're just living their life. They happen to be talented. They happen to be whatever it is that I want. They have it. And now I'm envious. So isn't it, isn't it foolish that we're blaming our envy on them when, in fact, they're just a catalyst for our envy? And what is so bad, if someone is a catalyst for a bad quality or a bad reaction within us, and we don't recognize that, that's a, that's a travesty, you know, because, because times like this, when things are difficult, sometimes it brings out the worst in us. And as a result, we can look at ourselves and go, okay, what's coming out of me? Let me look at this. This is interesting. I'm seeing, I'm seeing an aspect of myself that normally doesn't come out. This has this ever happened to you? Sometimes you just like you hit a wall and you 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 you're like under pressure or you're overworked or you're in a situation that's that you're not normally in, and then you start reacting like like in ways you don't normally react. It's it's real interesting to stand back and just ask yourself, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? What, why is this situation causing me to act this way? And then we'll try to make some excuse like, well, I'm overworked or this person deserved to be yell at, yelled at or whatever. And that there may be some truth to that, but ultimately we're supposed to look and say, wait a minute, but I didn't have to react that way. So what is, what is the cause? And then we look at the cause and then we can learn more about ourselves. At, during 9-11, we all had different reactions. Some people were really angry. Some people just like wanted to join the military and go Afghanistan and do something, right? Um, some people, you know, in that spirit, let's, let's, let's do something about terrorism. Other people become depressed. Other people just hide. Other people talk about it. Other people want to do something and you know, help people who were affected by it. Everyone has different reactions, but it's the same thing, but it's, it's just a catalyst for bringing different things out in us. And so what we want to do, how we, how we want to become as evolved spiritual people is when, when people push our buttons, we want to be able to react with empathy, compassion, kindness, understanding, patience, tolerance, integrity, et cetera. That's what, we, that's what we're trying to do. And when we don't do it, you know, and you know, you say, well, I meditate every day or I'm a spiritual person. That's fantastic. 
But when the rubber hits the road, you have to look, how did I react in this situation? And I call myself spiritual. I just got really upset in this situation. And I call myself spiritual. This, um, this Catholic monk, he told a beautiful story that illustrates this. He, he was like 50 years old, you know, he's been a monk forever. And he comes home and his mother never gets to see him. So this, you know, old Catholic sweet woman. So he, he goes in every morning like five and does, I don't, I'm not Catholic, so I don't know what they do, but going into some kind of prayer, maybe rosary, chanting, praying, studying, and his mother like knock, light, nightly locks on, nightly locks on the door, lightly knocks on the door. Harry, you want anything? No, I'm fine, mother. And he goes back praying, you know. You know, he comes back a minute later, you know, or five minutes later. It's kind of cold. I have a blanket. Okay, just leave it at the door, you know. You know, and then he says, I brought you some tea, you know. So she keeps doing this. And like the fourth time, he, leave me alone. I'm trying to meditate and pray. Just get out of here. So he was telling that story. He's saying like, like that was the paradox of the universe. I'm screaming at my mother telling her I'm trying to pray to God and you're bothering me. So he was reflecting on that, you know, and how, you know, how his, you know, I mean, it's understandable. You're in prayer and you're praying and someone's like, excuse me, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> you know where the bathroom is? <laughs> you know, and you're going, okay, it's over there. Okay. And you're going in prayer, you know, so, excuse me, excuse me. Uh, you want some water, you know, it's, so it's understandable, right? But still he, he, you know, he hit it on the head. He hit the nail on the head. He realized that, you know, he's in prayer and now he's becoming angry and what a paradox that, that was. So that these, these kinds of trying times, they, they, you know, they enable, or they can enable that kind of reflection. You know, when we're, when we're exhibiting qualities, which are not, the way they should be when we're upset, when we're blaming people, when we're blaming people for how we behave. These are the times we reflect and go, wait a minute, that that has to be, that has to be me. That has to be inside of me. And I can't blame them. Okay, sure. If they didn't say that, I wouldn't have become upset. But why when they said that wasn't I tolerant? Why didn't I hold that upset inside myself? And just, okay, all right. So um, should I continue more or should we take questions or both? Well, we have, uh, we have a couple of questions from, uh, one of our, uh, uh regulars of the Tom, uh, Anna, she's asking, uh, um, when my relationships get heady, I try to move into my heart and let it do the job instead. And my relationships get heavy or heady? Heady, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that, you know, the big, one of the big takeaways or realizations is that whatever you're feeling and that whatever you're feeling as a reaction to the situation is not, you don't have to feel that way, right? And even if you do feel that way, you don't have to act that way. That's really important because I think a lot of, a lot of us just think, I'm the way I'm reacting is natural. And so if you can go, like you say, from your head to your heart and react differently, then you've just proven what I've said that, yeah, we can, uh, and that can be done. Not only can be done, it should be done, but you have to know that you can do it because some people don't realize it. You know, here, here's an interesting meditation or just an interesting intellectual contemplation. We say, when we're angry, we say, I am angry, right? Now, to say I am angry means to say, that's who I, that's my identity, anger, which obviously anger is no one's identity, even if, even the angry person is not always angry. So anger is an emotion that we experience, but it's not an identity, you know? You have an identity, your name is, I am John Smith, I am from, wherever, wherever you're from, right? That's an identity that remains with you. I am angry. No, that's not your identity. 
And if you go to the spiritual, you're not even John Smith from such and such place. You're a spiritual being. So I am soul, I'm pure. But even if we don't take it that far for the, for the sake of understanding this, if you say, I am angry, it's not true. You're feeling angry. And that means you are different from your anger. Otherwise, how could you feel your anger if you, how could you be anger if you, and feel at the same time? You are observing it, you're feeling it, you're experiencing it. So there's this one training to control anger. It's just so interesting. It's, 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 instead of saying, I'm angry at you, someone may peacefully say, I'm feeling anger right now. I'm feeling upset and I, I don't want to talk about it, but there's no exhibition of it because they realize it's an emotion that they're experiencing and they don't have to give in to the emotion. So there's a, there's a kind of training like that of, of and because what you say affects how you think. So if you say, I'm feeling angry, it's different than saying, I am angry. Because when you say I'm angry, that becomes your identity and then you explode. But if you say, I'm feeling anger, your identity is, is separate. So, so that's interesting. Um, that's one interesting way of, of seeing anger. And then there's another interesting way. It's another, it's another, both of these are like spiritual angles on this. There's a, another way of looking at it is that I can let the anger go. I can practice detachment on an emotional level. level. So, so one is I observe the anger, I'm feeling it. And the second one is, can I let this feeling go? Am I willing to let it go, detached? Just like, let's let this go. Like when your friend's upset, what do you tell them? Just let it go, isn't it? Isn't that what you say? When your friend cups comes up, hey, he did this to me, and I, you know, I gotta get back at him, and you know, let's call the lawyer, and you're like, just let it go. This is crazy, right? So you can do that with yourself when you're upset. Just let it go. Just let it go. So you can take anger or any emotion and let it go. And so we have to practice that a lot, especially when we're all together. Now, one side point I was thinking this morning for all of those who are introverts, it's hard for introverts to be around people all the time. So that's even more of a challenge because introverts like being alone. In, you know, when the lockdown came, all the introverts were having a party. Oh, finally, I don't have to deal with people. I don't have to go to the office. I can just work from home. You know, I can't even go out of my house now. Wow, this is like heaven. I don't have to deal with people. That's the introvert. They're just like, they're like happy, right? Isn't it? Like, the introvert has a birthday party and it's like four people come. The extrovert has a birthday party and like 400 people come. You know, that's the different mentality. So I think, I think for, for many extroverts in general, they're probably have a hard, having a harder time now than introverts. My daughter was like, we are lockdown ended here in Florida. We have to go out with masks, but we can go out now and many places are open. And she went, she went yesterday and did some service. She, she helped uh, give out plates of prasadam spiritual food. And I said, how was it? How was it seeing people? She's like, oh, 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 it's so good to see people. Cause she was going crazy cause she couldn't see people. So, you know, it's probably harder for the extroverts right now. And probably harder for the introverts to be, or, you know, um, you know, we both, it, it, well, I don't wanna say it's harder. It, it's hard for the extroverts to not be around lots of people and hard for the introverts. If you, you know, if you got a big family and you're all together on top of you, that's probably hard. You, know? you just go in your room, lock the door, don't talk to me. So, you know, but, but I, don't, I don't ever think personally, I don't ever think challenges and difficulties should ever be seen as something we run away from or bad because it's just an opportunity to say, okay, now I, I'm in this situation. I need, how to, I need to learn how to deal with it. And I need to know more about myself. And if you're practicing spiritual life, you have so many tools. And, and then you can say, okay, well, now I'm being tested. So let's test the tools that I have. You know, I can say, I'm very tolerant. I practice spiritual life. I'm very tolerant. But maybe in your life, there's very little to tolerate. And you, that's why you're tolerant. You don't even know that you may not be tolerant until there's a situation that is more, more difficult. And so that's, that's what these difficult times do. They allow us 
to see aspects of herself that wouldn't normally come out. And we could very easily think, no, I'm beyond this. I transcended this. I'm beyond duality. I don't, this doesn't bother me. And then all of a sudden now you're in this situation and you're getting bothered and you realize, no, I thought I was better than I was. You don't really know. You know. It's like these boxers who think, you know, they can kill everybody. And then one day, you know, they go in the ring and the boxer, this boxer kills them. And they're just had no idea that anybody could beat them. So that's good. So I, I always think, you know, you don't want to run away from difficulty. You want to run into it and, and deal with it. And that, that way you grow. And if you're practicing spiritual life, you, you have so many tools with which to deal with it. So it's like, okay, here's my chance to use my tools. Otherwise, I just have tools in the garage, or as you say, garage, how do you say it? Garage? Garage. Garage. How do you say it in Scotland? Scotland. Oh, yeah. Garage. <laughs> yeah. So you have all the tools in your garage and um you just sit there you never use them because you know, there's nothing to build so so if you're practicing spiritual life if you're studying like bhagavad gita if you're chanting you have lots of tools so this is a good time to pull them out because you need them so i don't think we should run away i'm saying oh i never got to use these tools let's see how they work time to learn you know it's like you're you have a project and you have some software and you've never used an aspect of the software, but for this project, oh, we have to learn. Okay, so let's, let's do it. So that's how I see it. I had a question about that. Yes. It's just um, for us, um, we're practicing meditation and spiritual life to some degree. So we have a goal. I'm saying us as devotees of Krishna. So, um, but if somebody else is, uh, He's, he looks into the carpet and he sees there's all this death there. And uh, then he realizes all these different uh, things that he, he didn't want to see. If you don't have a spiritual goal, then uh, you, you, you could be easy just to think, well, what's the use? Well, yeah. You wouldn't see the benefit of all this, isn't it? Unless you have a spiritual goal. Well, uh, yeah. Well, some people have a goal of just being better people. So I would say even on the material level, if you see something that needs to be improved and you have um, a desire to improve and it's not depressing you, you would, you would take it that way. So I think it's the same materially and spiritually. And if your goal is to be spiritually evolved, then it's the same thing. You'll see the obstacle and you'll think, oh, I didn't know I had this obstacle. Or you'll think, Okay, now it's time to figure out how to get over this obstacle. So I think there's similarities there. It starts with a desire, and then you need some knowledge to know how to deal with it. So um, that's there. Um, what I've seen, one of the biggest obstacles I've seen, well, two obstacles I've seen is one, we don't recognize the problem. Obviously, can't, you cannot solve a problem unless you know you have it. That's a yeah statement, or however we say duh. But even though it's a duh statement, a lot of people have problems that everyone can see, all the other 8 billion people on the planet can see it. They're the only one, there's only one person that can't see your problem, you know? So it's usually us, we're the one who can't see it. And so the improvement starts with recognizing the problem and then a willingness to become better. And if you want to become better, you'll deal with the problem. And if you don't care about becoming better, so it's too much trouble to deal with the problem. I'm just like sweep it under the rug with all the other dirt. No one's going to see it. So materially it's true, spiritually it's true. So if, if you want to make progress, then you welcome the problems, the challenges, because it just makes you stronger. So what I've seen is if you even if you recognize the problem and you don't really have a desire to work on it, you kind of just rationalize it. It's not important. I couldn't conquer it anyway. It's not going to get in the way. It was just put it in the closet. No one cares. But if you're more intent on improving, then you you'll deal with it and say, okay, it's a problem. We need we need to work on it. 
my personal experience is the less problems you have, the happier you'll be. And 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 one of the things, you know, that's it's a it's a it's interesting. If you gain spiritual knowledge, you'll you'll start to understand more of the problems you're dealing with. When you gain spiritual knowledge, you, you'll realize a lot about ego, like in ways you never even imagined. You'll understand more deeply what humility is and how little of it you have. You'll start to understand how difficult it is to control the mind and senses because you're actually trying to control them. And there's two reactions. One is like, this is too hard. And the other one is, yes, let's go for it. This is, this is really, I didn't realize what was going on. And I realize now there's a lot of work to do and let's do it. This is what life is for. This is, you know, and my spiritual master used to say that, that life is for self-realization and you can do it as a human being, you you can actually do it. But if you don't, that's like the greatest loss because you know the other animals can't, but you can. And if you don't, then I don't want to say you're an animal, but in a sense, you had the a, an opportunity that a human being has and you didn't take it, which kind of equates you on the level of animals. It's like they say, a person who doesn't read it is no different from a, a person who can't read. Right. So a human being can take advantage of self-realization, but if they don't, then what's the significant difference between them and an animal who can? So some people may say, well, that's pretty heavy or hard, but you understand the point if you have an opportunity that you as a human being only have that animals don't have and you don't take advantage of it, then it's like a huge loss. So human, we have intelligence, we can contemplate, we can meditate, we can ask questions and we can, we can understand why things happen. We can, you know, we, we, um, I, I do a course on forgiveness and we're doing an illustration. And I was, this morning I was going through the illustrations so one illustration is a postman bringing a bunch of letters and it says bills on the letter. And nobody likes bills, right? We just like to give people our credit card and buy things. We just don't like to pay the bills at the end of the month. The first part is fun. The second part's not fun at all. Right? You actually have to pay for it. Not fun. So the postman comes with the bills and the sign says, messenger of your karma. Don't blame the messenger of your karma. Like, postman, I don't want to see you. Don't bring me bills. I don't like you. you. All you do is bring bills. Well, if you didn't spend money on your credit card, there would be no bills coming. So, so there, you know, there are ways to reflect on what's going on that are very, are very useful for us because we're human beings. We can think like this. Oh, this is the thing. Is, something bad is happening to me. How, how am I connected to that? What's the cause and effect? We can do that as human beings. So it's a great loss if we don't. And that's what he said. <clears throat> and that's my experience also. Because we, can, we're, we can have these like deep conversations. Can't we? I mean, mm. Any human being can have, you know, ask questions, think about this. That's what human in, intellect can do. And so to not use it, it's unfortunate. It's a real misuse of human life. So, yes. What else? So Anna also she's saying is it's safer to be upset about small things. Is it safer, or it, she's making a statement or a question? She's making a comment that it's safer to be upset about the small things. But <laughs> it's safer. But your life may not always have small things in it. But, but Anna, this is my experience. This is really important. If, if we get upset about the small things, then we're more likely to get upset about the big things, vice versa. If we don't get upset about the small things, we're less likely to get upset about the big things. And this is, this is really important because it's like we're cultivating a certain mentality. And that I, I'd rather learn to become patient and tolerant with everything, the, uh, every little thing is that will help with the big things. Because it's like, a, it's like a muscle, you're training yourself to be more tolerant, you know. It's like, it's like um, 
anything you do that's difficult. Have you ever done this? You did something that's really difficult. And then like a few weeks later, later you did something completely different, but it was difficult. But it, now it wasn't so difficult because what you did before was so difficult. This doesn't seem difficult. Whereas if you didn't do this thing before, this would seem difficult. So it's something like that. You just, look, I got rid of this problem. You know, I tolerated this and that and that. When I run into the bigger thing, I'm, I'm practiced. This is you know, going to work. Um, I had a question. It was just, um, how do we um, realize how much control we really have over our emotions? Because generally we just, if, if, we, if something makes us angry or we react in a certain yeah. way. So um, how do we um, become aware and actually are able to implement this ability to just choose, okay, well, I don't like this emotion, so I'm not going to get angry. I'm going to, in fact, I'm yeah. going to get how can we, how do we do it, it? It's going to require lots of self-control and lots of patience. Now, I was thinking when you were saying that of a strange example, but I'll give it because I think it'll illustrate this. Let's say you just like grew up in this neighborhood where it was really poor and nobody bought anything. You just go to the store and you know, a little bag and you stick everything in the bag and your friends talk to the guy at the counter and you just walk out. And that's what you do. And it was like, it was like you come to this point in your life where like buying, you think buying something is stupid. You could steal everything. You know? So you're kind of addicted to stealing. And then, you know, you, you reconcile with it and you realize, no, this is wrong, this is bad. And you go in the store and you're thinking in your mind, I could steal so many things and now I'm, I'm gonna pay for it. And you wanna steal it rather than pay for it. And, and so it's just, it's just, I have to act on intelligence. I cannot act on this addiction or this feeling. And so it's like that anything you're feeling you have to tell yourself okay i have to tolerate this feeling just like this guy he wants to steal because that's what he does it's like he's crazy for him to spend money he just steals no okay i've, I've made a vow i'm not going to steal but the desire to steal is very strong so something like that it's like okay i want to do it i want to do it no no but i can't right yeah. not now it's it's not now I'll, you know put it off put it off put it off not tomorrow not next week so we have to realize that we can do that. So you feel depressed, you feel anxious, you feel intolerant, angry. Just remind yourself, I don't, even though I feel upset, I don't have to act that way. Even though I'm angry, I don't have to become angry at anybody. And even though I'm feeling <clears throat> impatient, I can calm down and, and what I think the biggest challenge for most of us is that we don't have a lot of experience of not acting on how we feel. We generally, you know, if we're angry, we tell somebody what you did was wrong. Um, if we can't tolerate something, we tell everybody, oh, this is so bad, I hate it, isn't it? You ever done that? Oh my God, this is so bad. How could they do this? Why are they doing, you know, we're just, we're so used to just complaining, isn't it? Rather than, okay, I'm not going to say anything. I, I don't have to say anything. I feel this way, but I don't have to say it. That's where the practice starts. And just like I was telling Anna, if you practice that with little things, you can practice it with big things. You know, just like sometimes, sometimes something may be bothering you and you're feeling bad. Sometimes it may be better just don't say anything. Because often by saying something, it gets worse. Not always, but sometimes it makes it worse. So you can do that. My personal experience is just knowing you can do it is you're halfway there because I think a lot of us don't even think we can do that. We just think, no, this person did this. So I yelled at him. It's normal. I've done it all my life. That's what I do. Well, I'm here to tell you, you don't have to do that. And it's not, it might be normal for you, but it's not normal. If the whole world acts normal like that, well, we're going to have a very messed up world. What if every time you became upset, you just you flipped it around and said, okay, I, I want to understand why he did this. There must be a reason. Or maybe he's having a bad day. And you know, maybe maybe, maybe instead of becoming angry, I could just say, is there anything I can do? It looks like you're not feeling well. 
What if everyone in the world did that? What an amazing place that would be. So these, these are ways to think. Otherwise, it's like saying, you know, I'm, I'm not in control of my life, but that's not true. And there's everyone understand there's karma for whatever we do. So even if you say you're not in control, but still you get the karma, you're gonna get karma. You know, this guy didn't treat you well, you lash out at him, you'll get the karma for, for doing that, even though he did it first. So we have to understand that. And it you know, says, sometimes, sometimes people say, I say, why are you doing this? Go, well, everybody's doing it. It's wrong, but yeah, but everyone's doing the wrong thing. Why? Well, everybody's doing it. So because everyone's doing it, it makes it's okay, right? No, is it, that thinking is. Or because everyone's doing it, we think, well, there's no way not to do it because that's what everybody does. Or we, or worse, we think it's good because everybody does it. Well, just because everybody does something doesn't make it good. It just makes it that everybody's doing it. And a lot of times, the fact that everyone's doing it proves that it's wrong <laughs> sometimes because there's a lot of ignorance out there, right? Huh. And Anna what says, just to clarify, she says um, um, she sees that some people don't get upset over big stuff, but they get upset about small stuff. Yeah. Well, there's another problem, Anna which may be happening, these may be passive aggressive people. Passive aggressive people hold things in and then <sighs> comes out. So maybe this type holds in the big things and comes out the small things. But um, I would say, um, you know, everybody's different. But I would say, at least if we understand that if you evolve yourself, if you evolve your consciousness, you could come to a point where you very rarely get upset. Things will not bother you. You can come to that level. Big things, small things. And I think what you say may be true for some people and maybe the opposite for other people. Only the big things, not the little things, but it's still, um, generally, yeah, that sounds like a personality trait to me. Like, you know, it's like, you know, they say, you know, choose your wars, choose your wars wisely, battle, choose your battles wisely. So maybe, maybe that's their battle, the small things. Maybe, maybe they don't want to upset anybody too much. So they don't want to fight the big battles. Who knows? But managing, in, in any case, managing your emotions, managing your anger is super important, materially and spiritually. There's so much parallel between the material and spiritual because you're dealing with a mind and senses and focus and goals. So you have to control your mind, you control your senses, you have to focus, you have to have goals that can be material or spiritual, but the same psychology and the same practices are generally necessary. But on the spiritual platform, it's easier because you have strength that's transcendental, it's pulling you up, it's helping you go beyond. And because you see that your soul, not the body, your consciousness, your, your awareness, so you're aware of your emotions. You are not your emotion. You are not angry, you have anger. You are not sadness. You're experiencing it, but you are not the sadness. You are the experiencer of the sadness. Isn't that interesting? Instead of saying, I'm sad today, say, today I am experiencing sadness. And then I asked you the question, well, how does the experiencer feel? Because the experiencer is not sadness. So how does the experiencer feel? And from the spiritual point of view, the experiencer is very happy, very peaceful. <laughs> if, you, if you go back to the experiencer, oh, he's, he's, like, he's just looking at the depression. He's got nothing to do with it. Yeah. That's spiritual life. That's how it works. They did a test, um, they, they uh, took the blood out of a person that was angry and they put it into a rat and it killed the rat. Oh my God, are you because serious? It was toxic in the blood, yeah. So they say that when you get angry, it, does a, it, does a, it has a terrible effect on your, on your health. Yeah, yeah. Okay, everybody, you heard it right from Adoxaja. 
you get angry, you're going to kill yourself. You know what the Chinese say? They say, if you're going to hold on to resentment, you need to build two graves, one for the person you're resenting and one for yourself, because you're going to kill yourself also. So, um, okay, I guess we're ended. We're ending now. Is that true? Is that um, yeah, um, they're thanking you. We've got a, about 30 people watching on Facebook. So Good. they're thanking you for your, uh, Laura says, thank you very much. Helping 30 us people on Facebook in addition. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, uh, and Anna's asking, the experiencer is the medicine. The medicine to neutralize your, what, you have to remind me of the context. What was I saying? You were saying um, the- I didn't tell the story. I had an experience, but I didn't tell it. You're saying you, you feel sad and then you realize you're the experiencer of sadness. Yeah. So then if you realize that, that's like the medicine, isn't it? Yeah, well, you are, Anna, your nature is blissful. You're a spiritual being, so you're blissful. So if you realize that, even when you're not blissful, you, you realize this is my nature. And what, what I'm experiencing is, is something I'm observing that's outside of me. And it's not me, which is really good news. It's, it's if you ever get depressed or whatever, angry, envious, or whatever, it's good news to know that's not you. You are you and your pure nature are blissful and have nothing to do with this. You know, that's your nature is to be always happy and satisfied. It's just we're not, you know, that nature has been like buried you know, like deep down, and we have to bring it out. And it's covered by all the envy and all this other stuff and the anger and so forth, it's covered. But through spiritual practice, you uncover it. And then if you ever do get angry, it's just like, oh, that's just anger. It's not, it's just, let it go. Just watch it go by. Detach, I can't control it. And a detachment is a real medicine, real panacea. Because you detach from what you can't control. So that's very good. That's, that helps tremendously. Detachment is like so important. In our society today, they're just telling you, you know, like get more, get more, get more, go up, go up, go, bigger job, more money, bigger car, bigger house, get more stuff, fill your house up with stuff, then buy more and fill your garage up with stuff, and then buy more and get rid of the old stuff, put in new stuff. It's like, you know, so, you know, detachment goes against the whole grain of modern society, but it, it's so important. Detachment brings a tremendous amount of happiness. Contrary to popular belief, perhaps. You know, having more stuff makes you happier, but detachment is really, sim simplicity and detachment is beautiful. That's my experience, you know. Anyway, you know, the, the whole world is, you know, it's like, we're not going to be here in a little while. So, you know, don't get too attached. <laughs> it's like my spiritual master would say, you go to a hotel, you know, how attached are you going to get to the hotel room? You're only there for a few days. So he said, this life in this world is like a hotel room for a few days. Don't get too attached. And, and he said, and you go to the hotel, you meet some people, the, the room next to you, the room across from you. Ah, what's your name? You, know, you met them and then you'll never see them again. And he said, relationships in this world, it's like we're in a hotel, we meet hotel guests and then we're gone. And it's all over, you know, at the end. And it's like, wow, I can't take anything with me. So people nearing death, they're the most, they, they, I talked to someone who deals with people dying. She said, there's so many people are extremely peaceful before they die because they just, they detach totally. They can't, there's, they're on their way out, they know it, then they detach and then they just like, ah, oh, and everything's easy now. I don't have to control anything. There's nothing to hold on to. I'm leaving all of this. So they become so peaceful. So detachment has that, that value. And as you become spiritually evolved, you naturally become detached. Don't even have to try, it just happens. You know, it happened to me, it was so interesting. I was a college student when I first started studying Bhagavad Gita and chanting. And so, 
that was in a, um, during the hippie days. It was 1969, so the hippie movement was still very strong. And this was in Berkeley, which is just across the, from San Francisco. And San Francisco was like the, really was the main place of the hippie movement. And so Berkeley was just an extension, maybe even more crazy than San Francisco. And, you know, it was all drugs, sex, and rock and roll. That was just like breakfast, lunch, and dinner was drugs, sex, rock and roll, even if you were a student. And so I started chanting and studying Bhagavad Gita, and I think it was about four to six weeks after that. I woke up, sex, drug, and meat. There's hardly any vegetarian. You know, do you know in 1969, like how many vegetarians there were? Didn't we figure that out last week? Yeah. Point zero zero was like yeah. one out of a thousand or something, wasn't it? Or yeah. 10,000. It was like some were vegetarian. You like take, call an ambulance and take him to the hospital. Like, He's a vegetarian. He, he can't live. He's not eating meat. You don't take him to the hospital. It was, I'm serious. Like people were like, well, like, how could you be vegetarian? You'll die. Seriously, people would say that to me when I met them. So one day I woke up, it was probably after six weeks, and I thought to myself, you know, you haven't taken drugs in a few weeks. That's like your world's record since you're 15 years old, you know. Two or three weeks. It was like that didn't happen. You know, this was I was 19. You're not eating meat, you're not having sex. You know, it was like I was talking to myself and going, yeah, you know, you're right. You haven't done that. And I wasn't even trying not to do it. It just happened because I was practicing. I was chanting, I was studying. So I was, I was kind of like transcending, you know, feeling like very blissful up here. So naturally I didn't have to like do stuff on this level. But my point was it happened naturally. I didn't even, I, I didn't, I wasn't like on my schedule by this date no meat, no drugs, no sex. It's just like one day I woke up and I said, that's amazing, I haven't done this in weeks. So it happens like that as you evolve spiritually. You don't even have to try per se, it'll just, you're, you're higher. So things now where they used to be look lower and look distasteful because you're experiencing something better. So that was my experience. That was like my, oh my God, experience. Oh my God, I haven't, you know, I mean, I mean, you think this is funny, but just think, since I was 15, I mean, I grew up in that time, you know, I came of age when everything happened, it's 1965 in America, that's when the whole hippie movement just blew up and everything changed, like in six months, all, like all these straight, straight A student friends are like all spaced out, LSD, growing their hair, and wanting to drop out, it was like, woo! So, I grew up in that culture, you know, and so I started doing that at 15. I'm just being honest, it sounds funny, but there, there was no question of not taking something every weekend, you know, to have fun. And so when I didn't do it for two, three weeks, it was, I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. I haven't, you know, I'm not thinking about women. I'm like, I don't care. I had really, you know, got something so much better I didn't have to try to give it up. It was just, it's not on my mind, you know? So whenever you, you can evolve and have something better, the lesser things, they, they're not on your mind anymore. You know? And that's, it's true materially also. You just get like a $2,500 guitar and there's your $99 guitar sitting in your room. Like, forget that, you know, throw that out in the trash can. You don't care anymore. You got your 2,000, well, 2,000 pound guitar. Actually, they have a really good guitar in, out of the farm. I played it. It's from Czechoslovakia or somewhere. Handmade. Amazing. Now you're going to go out there, right, and try to steal it. Don't, don't try to steal it. But, yeah, anyway, that's an analogy for guitar players. But you can, you can replace your item of choice and say, you know, I had this little camera, but now I got the... I just saw yesterday, you can get a video cameras for $90,000. Can actually pay that much. If you want to make major motion pictures, yeah, I got my ninety thousand dollar video camera, so I'm throwing my other camera away. You know, my other ten thousand dollar camera, yeah, I'll throw it in the trash. Who needs it? It's like that. Okay, so we can stop now. Yes, happy to be with all of you. I think a lot of you are the same from last time.
and uh, yeah. we look forward to spending more time with you in the future as yeah. time allows when we are able yes thank you very much thank you thank you